This week on Quadriga, is the euro crisis too big to master? Greece is sliding towards bankruptcy. And Spain's economy is in serious trouble. The ratings agencies are issuing more negative forecasts, including for havens of stability such as Germany. The international backers have returned to Athens to check on progress and step up the pressure. The idea that Greece might leave the Eurozone is no longer taboo, but some say such talk is fueling the crisis. Can Europe afford more help for Greece? And can Spain solve its problems in time? Your host this week is Ali Aslan. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. The Eurozone and the Euro crisis is entering a very decisive stage, one which could spell the end of Greece in the Eurozone. Is Greece doomed to leave the Eurozone and what ramifications would such a move have? That's what we're going to talk about on today's show with my three experts who've been following the story very closely. Welcome to Moritz Döbler, who is the chief business editor at the German daily Der Tagesspiegel. Friederike Spieker is an economist who has published widely on international economic policy. And Silke Wettach is the EU correspondent for the German business weekly Wirtschaftswoche. Welcome to you all, Moritz Döbler. Is this the final round for Greece? Does Greece finally have to stare into the abyss and leave the exit, leave the Eurozone? Well, there has been talk about Greece leaving the Eurozone for a long, long time. Uh, we're talking about this crisis for this Greek crisis, this Greek tragedy for two, two and a half years. And there's always been talk about whether or not Greece should leave the Eurozone. My opinion is that Greece is such a small problem compared to the scale of the European Union as a whole that it should be possible to solve it. Um, also, I think they had just had a time of campaigning and elections, and it's obvious that you can't push reforms through while you are campaigning for to to uh, to win elections. So I think probably Greece needs a little more time, and we shouldn't be talking about. Um, Eurozone members leaving the Eurozone, but we should talk about how to strengthen the Eurozone, how to strengthen the, uh, the Union as a whole. So are you confident that uh, the EU will survive this round as well, that Greece will survive well, this round as well? I think confident is a strong word. Um, I think it's very critical right now. Um, it's not only critical because of Greece and Spain, but also I think the markets are waiting for political signals Uh, that the European Union is going to strengthen itself. When you look, for instance, across the Atlantic to the United States, the debt situation there is worse than in Europe. But the markets respect the United States much higher. My opinion is that that's because they are a functioning union. So our aim should be to create a functioning union in Europe. Friederike Spieger, many leading German politicians have come out this week and in the previous week more offensively calling now for a Greece exit, Greek exit uh, from the Eurozone. They're saying that such a move would be controllable and that the fear, if you will, of such a move has vanished by now. What do, what do you make of it? I think they are wrong. They are totally wrong. I think an exit of Greece from the Eurozone um, will cause damage not only to, the, to Greece itself, but also to the Eurozone and to the whole Europe and with repercussions uh, in the world, in the rest of the world. So I think we should do everything to keep Greece inside the European Monetary Union and help them. And I agree, totally agree with your opinion uh, that we should give them more time and we should stop all measures uh, that deepen the depression they are in. Mm -hmm. They are not able um, to meet the deficit Uh, targets they are told by the EU, especially told by the German government, uh, when we force them into depression. And so it's kind of unfair uh, to say um, you have to leave before because it's um, very painful for the Greek people and unfair. And um, it will not end the euro crisis. I'm very sure it will fuel the euro crisis and uh, the domino effects this will have for Spain and Italy and in the last uh, also for France will be huge. And this is not in the German interest. It's not in the German interest. Silke Wettach, you are the EU correspondent. You are in Brussels, based in Brussels. So you certainly get a vibe, get the pulse of what's going on in Brussels. Tell us, what's the sense there? Very much so. I think no one in, in Brussels really wants Greece to leave. And I think German politicians who have come out saying that they think that uh, an exit would be controllable 
I think they're playing very much to a national audience. I mean, they really um, have their uh, electorate uh, in in mind. But um, I wouldn't quite agree. I think I can understand that the pressure is mounting on Greece. I see that patience is running out because time after time they're just not doing what they're supposed to do. They've had two elections. Um, they've had elections because one of the parties decided it was a good time to have elections. I think it would have made much more sense to have elections at a later stage. And party politics is really a mess. And I don't see the country coming out uh, with this government. And I think that is very, very serious. Moritz Döbler, it's very worrisome for some that the IMF now is saying they see no progress in Greece whatsoever. And they, basically the IMF has been saying they are no longer willing to, to bail out and, and fund Greece's uh, rescue efforts. What do you make of it? Well, if I, if I read that correctly, then that was leaked uh, to a magazine uh, last weekend. And it was leaked just before the Troika um, was uh, traveling to Athens to find out what the progress is. So I think those statements leaked to media um, are have, an, have a hidden agenda, just like the statement of the German economics, economics minister um, yesterday or the day before, uh, that uh, it was not taboo for Greece to leave the union. Um, I think we should really have a look at the progress report. Uh, it's very obvious that Greece did not meet all uh, criteria. It's very obvious that they are lagging behind. But I think the, the main dis debate should be how to make things work. And the main thing should be uh, what kind of business model can we as Europe create for Greece? Um, we, we've been talking about this crisis for two, two and a half years, and tourism is the main industry in Greece right now. Now, tourists are not traveling there because they find the situation unstable. Now, that's the kind of thing we can't do. You know, um, if, if we want to help Greece, we should help find uh, industry sectors that work for Greece. But I think we can't help them. I think they need to help themselves. They need to help themselves, but they also need help from the outside. I mean, the main one, ma one big problem is the bureaucracy in Greece. It does, it's not functioning. It's not functioning at all. Okay, Germany has a pretty good record about bureaucracy, so I think maybe we can help, but not as colonial masters, but as partners. And Friederike Speaker, um, again, some German politicians have been saying, echoing pretty much what Silke Wettach is saying, that the solution does not lie in Berlin or Brussels, but in Athens itself. And if there's no willingness, no sign of the willingness, uh, then perhaps it's better to let them go. I disagree. Um, I think we do not start to talk about the core of the crisis. The core is not in Greece and not bureaucracy, not working bureaucracy and corruption and bad tax revenues. Uh, the core is um, the competitiveness, which is not there in the southern European countries, not only in Greece, but also in Spain and Italy. And competitiveness is a relative concept, not an absolute concept. So you, you are competitive against someone else. And this someone else, uh, these are the surplus countries in the European Monetary Union, especially Germany. So the competi competitiveness of Germany is much, much higher than that of uh, the southern European countries. And a solution which will take time to get there is to um, reconcile the different competitiveness of these countries. Mm. And you should do this not in a defl deflationary way, because uh, the deflation we force them to have, for example, wage cuts, um, causes a depression where the countries can't work anymore. The economy in these countries is uh, down, down to earth. And so if we want to solve, really solve the problem, we need that Germany loses competitiveness against these countries and the other countries win competitiveness. So this process will take time around 10 years, the same time uh, it took um, Germany to get this high competitiveness. So when we started in 1999, uh, the uh, euro, um, each country entry, entering um, the EMU had a special um, exchange rate to get inside. And this exchange rate was defined so that the goods basket was quite the same in price between all these countries. And then Germany started not to stick to the treaty the European Central Bank had. Uh, 
Germany didn't stick to the 2% inflation target. And this is the problem we are talking about. The other, the southern countries, didn't stick to this aim as well, but Germany was far more away from the 2% target uh, than the southern countries. I completely disagree because mm. I think Germany can't afford uh, to decrease its, its competitiveness. Mm. I mean, the, the world is not just Europe. The world is far bigger and you have a lot of other countries c catching up um, who are going uh, to, to, to pass. So I think that is a completely a wrong approach. Mm. And I don't agree that you say it's not uh, relevant to tackle um, sort of bureaucracy and corruption. I think bureaucracy and corruption are at the core of the lack of competitiveness, not only just in Greece, we've seen it in Spain. I mean, the Spanish banking problem is a problem that has been caused by corruption and cronyism, cronyism especially, I mean, friends of friends, they all had their amigos. In Ireland, it was a complete pro uh, problem of corruption. It was also, it was just a couple of people, it was maybe 10 people who, who really um, brought down the country. So I think good governance is really something that should be established within the Eurozone and I think that is the biggest challenge we're going to face in the next few years because no political union is going to achieve that. Well, let's do uh, uh, yeah, I want to um, get to the, back to the point of competitiveness. Um, I don't think uh, a union is, is created because you want to um, give strength to weaker members and you want to share. I mean, that's what a union is about. But I agree that the solution for the Greek crisis is not uh, less competitiveness of the German industry, for instance. I think, yes, Greece has to become more competitive, but the competitors are probably not Germany. I mean, they're not going to start building industrial machines in, Greek that can com in Greece that can compete with, say, Daimler or whatever. Uh, what they need to be able to do is they need to be able to compete, for instance, with the textile industry in Turkey, uh, the textile industry in Vietnam, with tourism industry in Spain. I mean, I don't think the union is about having the same uh, economic level in all parts of the union. There's a difference between Kentucky and California. There's a difference between Berlin and Bavaria. There is a difference between Greece and Germany. But still, we need to work on that competitiveness. That's a very good point. And the question, of course, still remains, has Green, Greece done enough up until, no, until now? It's been given two, two and a half years, as was pointed out during this discussion. Friederike Spieker is saying it might take up to 10 years for Greece to reach an economic level that is up to par with its partners. But does it still have the time? Will Greece be given the time to get their act together? Let's have a look. Privatization of state industries, labor market reform, better tax collection and government spending cuts. The list of things Greece is supposed to be doing to combat the crisis is long. There have been successes. The country's overall deficit has been cut almost in half in the last couple of years, despite the shrinking economy. The minimum wage has been cut by almost a quarter, and many thousands of public sector jobs have gone. But the European Commission says the fight against tax evasion has been far too timid. And there has been little progress on the target of privatizing 50 billion euros worth of state assets, including energy infrastructure and airports. Athens says it will redouble its efforts, but also that after five years of recession, it needs more time to get its house in order. Well, Zülke Wetach, we just saw Greece is asking for more time. It says it needs more time. Should it be given more time? Well, more time is costly. You know, there's been an estimate that it could be between 10 million, billion and 50 billion if you give them to, uh, two more years. So I don't think other countries are willing to give that kind of money. Uh, I was in Estonia last week. Um, the Estonian Minister of Finance said to me, you know, we are poorer than they are. Why should we give them money? I can't ask my people to give them more money. They've had their opportunity. They've been given 400 billion so far. It's 177% of their GDP. Think of the Marshall Plan, plan after the war. It was 2% of the German GDP. So I think they have had uh, support. It's not as if they hadn't, haven't received anything. Um, they really must get their act together. Speaker, I assume you have a different opinion. 
Yeah, I think you should uh, think about alternatives. So costs are always a concept in alternatives. And if the alternative is much ex more expensive uh, than uh, to buy more time for Greece, uh, this is the point we have to discuss. Not that the buying time is costly, of course, but the alternative to send a Europe in a deflationary depression is much um, more expensive, I would say. So I wouldn't agree. And um, I think the hope that if we um, leave Greece uh, outside the European Monetary Union um, will solve any problem in Europe. This is not correct. So I agree with your opinion. We should find a way how it works, how a monetary union works. And uh, it would have worked from the beginning, although there are differences between mm. the countries and the capital stock between the countries and therefore uh, differences between the productivity in each country. Uh, we have the chance uh, to make a monetary union without a fiscal union, without a political union, if every country sticks to the inflation target. Mm -hmm. And we should have put this down in the Maastricht Treaty. But we only talk about um, government spending, only about deficit, uh, only about sovereign debt. And so the treaty is wrong constructed. If everybody sticks to the same inflation rate, the basket of goods is the sa at the same price between the countries. It includes corruption and tax problems. So the price level is the main um, measure of what is going on in a country. And if a country is very unproductive and very corrupt, they can't have so high wages, of course. This is correct. But if you stick to the inflation target, you all um, have it inside. All those problems are inside and are solved. Every country can try to be more efficient, to be more productive. This is fine. But this should be reflected in the wage income. And for example, in Germany, there is no uh, reflection of the productivity growth we had in real income, in real wage incomes. And this is the problem we have here. So we try to export our unemployment to other countries. We were successful in this. And now this strategy uh, came to an end. And speaking of Germany, um, there are some people who are saying that a Greece exit would cost Germany up to 80, perhaps even 90 billion mm -hmm. euros. But there are also some who are saying that the rescue packages put together for Greece would equal that amount. So. Well, let's talk about cost for a moment. Um, first of all, nobody knows. That's very simple. Nobody can calculate the cost of a Greek exit uh, because it's hard to calculate. But the thing is, even if Greece left the Eurozone, we would have to pay as Europe for the reforms in Greece, for the process in Greece, because Euro Greece would leave the Eurozone, but Greece would definitely not leave the European Union. And the European Union is still a functioning union, in a way at least. And so we would have to tackle this reform process no matter what. So I don't see any, any upside to uh, Greece leaving the Eurozone. And also, I don't see how we would kick them out because there's no provision there in the, in, in the, in the European contracts. And I don't see them leaving by themselves. So I don't think it's a viable option. It's, it, it's just not there. The option is just not there. Uh, it's not going to happen. Zürke Wetzach, do you think at this point it's more about politics than economics? Do you think that the political considerations are outweighing the economic Concerns? I would say so. I would say so because I mean I do see a will in Brussels to keep them in, but um, I don't think anyone. Well, as you said, it's very hard to calculate the costs anyway. I mean, to have a cost-benefit uh, an analysis of this is is nearly impossible. Um, and I, I would also think all the pressure that's being built up at the moment uh, is really. Uh, I mean, this is really done with a aim uh, to to get them going. But at the same time, I'm just so skeptical that anything will happen there because the people who are governing are the ones that actually created all the mess. But and that is that, that I mean, I, I find that very difficult to swallow for the people who live there. You know, I feel for them. Um, but it's also very difficult for people like in Brussels, politicians, to negotiate with them because it's, it's actually the ones who created uh, all the chaos and, and uh, the political problems. But, but then again, sometimes there is progress, you know. Um, Seven years ago, Germany was dubbed the sick man of Europe. Everybody was talking about how bad the economy in Germany is. And now we are, we are here seven years later, and Germany all of a sudden is the 
pre premier economy in in Europe. So things have changed within seven years. I'm not so sure. I'm not. But this is Germany. This is not Greece. You have a functioning state. In Greece, you have a nearly failed state. You have an administration that's not working. I mean, people from the Commission, they will tell you, we go there and it's just not working. We see ministries that don't talk to each other. Um, you have an administration that is just not up to the standard we used to in Central Europe. Um, so I think it's very, very hard really to start any changes because, I mean, look at the it, privatization The way you talk body. about Greece, um, I think anybody who lives in this town of Berlin would say that you could talk the same way about the state of Berlin. You know, <laughs> I think it's possible to, to uh, start change. I think, um, and has it also, changed Berlin. I mean, if you if you claim it's it that not, way, apparently well, it hasn't changed. Well, maybe it hasn't changed, but then again, maybe the problem is not as big as we perceive it. As we perceive it. Well, the I commission mean, think it's a it's a major problem. It's a you major talk problem. To these but people, they say we don't know what to do. But we don't European, know which ministry to the talk European to. The European Union, with the twenty seven states as a whole, is the biggest economy in the world. It's far bigger than the United States, far bigger than China, and Greece is just such a small portion of that economy. It's become a big problem for everyone. So let's solve it. So may I, may I say something to this point? Um, even if you can't change anything in Greece, it would be much cheaper for Germany just to save them. Simply to say, even if it's a problem to tell this German voters, I'm not. I was uh, going to say politically, I, it's not I, 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 I won't uh, agree that Greece can't be changed. But it's a point that you say there's no no one you can talk to and who really wants the change. But no, this I didn't is say this they is want the change. Yeah, the, the people uh, want the change, but perhaps not the politicians, which are um, now um, uh, in the government. That that may be. But nevertheless, I would agree that it's much easier to save them uh, than to get to an explosion of the European Monetary Union. And we, we are uh, heading to this problem. And um, we can't get out of this uh, when we started, because the domino effect for Spain and for Italy is, in my eyes, is guaranteed. So uh, everybody knows that the European stabilizing, um, the ESM, um, is too, is, is too uh, small um, to carry up um, all problems you have with the Spanish debt and with the Italian debt. So if we start uh, and let some, uh, one country outside of the EMU, uh, we will create the problem in Spain and Italy. And um, this will be very costly for Germany because the new currency we then get, a new D-Mark or a North Euro or whatever, will be appreciated uh, around 20 to 40 percent, and then our export markets are gone, at once gone. And if we try to have a higher inflation through a better wage bargaining here in Germany, we have 10 years' time to get adjusted uh, in export markets. We don't lose export markets, but we get adjusted that the gains on export markets are smaller. So this is a wonderful option for the German industry to lose in little, little steps some competitiveness. And your argument that um, it's not possible for the German industry to lose competitiveness because there's something outside Europe, I understand. But there are exchange rates outside Europe. And other countries are not waiting for the net exports of Europe as a whole. So the strategy uh, our chancellor um, uh, is forcing that uh, whole Europe should be co more competitive. Against whom, I want to ask? Against the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is not waiting for our net exports, for European net exports. Japan tries to make itself net exports because it is in a deflationary state. Uh, the United States are highly uh, indebted in foreign um, currencies or in, in, in foreign countries. And uh, China tries uh, to keep its net exports not as high as it did before, but it doesn't want our net exports. It, it doesn't want deficits. But competitiveness aside, Moritz Döble, it seems clear that Germany is no longer immune from this euro crisis itself. Moody's, the rating agency, has just uh, issued a bleak outcome, if you will, a st stern warning to Germany saying, along with the Netherlands and Luxembourg, that they themselves might soon be in trouble. And uh, for a chancellor that is facing re-election in 2013, that might be a tough sell. Uh, the rating was not lowered, just the outlook is now negative, uh, not stable. Um, if, if you look at what we've been talking about, 
um, I would say it's a very natural change of the outlook. I would say the outlook is negative, not stable. Yeah. I mean, that's why we talk about this, because the outlook is negative. So Moody's didn't say anything that could surprise anybody. Moody's stated the truth. We are at a, a very dis in a very decisive phase. We need, to f we need to make decisions about how to deal with Greece and, and that's far more important, I think, we need to de make decisions about how to deal with Europe. Um, I think the, the, the idea that we have a currency union but not a political union, it doesn't work. And uh, would you say that uh, Germany now has reacted rather coolly to Moody's announcement, saying that, well, at the end of the day, it was so... But so have the markets. I mean, it didn't have any impact. I think it was a very appropriate reaction. Uh, Moody's, they were just stating the obvious. Right. I mean, nobody could really contest that. So, so I think that the reaction that was, that was very well done. I think communication in general is rather a problem because we haven't heard from anyone, where is the European Union going? I find the sum, you know, summit after summit, there is some progress, but I find communication is a disaster. We've seen at the last summit that um, Mario Monti, uh, the, the Italian um, prime minister, he came out before everyone uh, and he gave a completely different version of uh, what everyone else uh, had experienced. I think that is very bad and I think that is really the difference between the US and Europe. Exactly. You know, you have a, a cac cacophony that, that is really tremendous and I think we saw it also at the G20. I mean, everyone gave advice to Europe how to come out of, of the crisis. I think Europe is really losing its soft power. How you would know. you assess Chancellor Merkel's crisis management up until now? I think um, her communication is a real problem. And I think she's not really assuming leadership in the way she should. Um, and I think she should travel to all those countries. I think she, yes. she should communicate with the Greeks, with the Spanish. She should explain to them that we, you know, we are aware of their suffering. It's not something abstract, you know. I mean, people are really suffering. Their, their incomes have been slashed. I mean, salaries have been slashed by quite a lot. Um, but she should go out and talk to them. And I think in Greece, mm -hmm. they're even, I mean, they're waiting for her leadership. I agree, yes. But also I think, um, let, let's look at it the other way. What if Merkel had come out two and a half years ago and said, listen, people, um, we have this crisis in Europe and it's going to cost you one to two billion trillion uh, euros. Uh, she would not be in office anymore. So the 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 step-by-step -step approach that she has that's very tiring to anybody listening and looking at her, the step-by-step -step approach probably is the only way to handle this crisis because if she had come out with the actual damage to two, two and a half years ago, she would not be in place anymore, probably wouldn't even have a Eurozone anymore. But I think she needs to communicate more and she needs to talk about options, right. she needs about cost. And where are we going? I mean, we don't really know where we're going. And I think, I would think be good if, it yes. would be really good for markets to know where we're yeah. going. I think markets will want to, new, to know. A vision for yeah. this union. Yeah. Where is Germany going is indeed, not just the European Union, but also where is Germany going is indeed a question. And more importantly, is Germany overstretching itself perhaps in all these rescue efforts? Let's have a look. At the moment, Germany still has a AAA credit rating. But the logic is simple. If Berlin, as Europe's paymaster, has to support more and more failing countries, ultimately that will weigh on Germany's own situation. That's why Moody's has issued a negative forecast, not just for the nation as a whole, but for individual German regions whose debt costs are closely intertwined with national finances. According to one study, if Greece goes bankrupt, the cost to Germany would be well over 80 billion euros, not including the losses to German banks and other investors. It might be possible to absorb that amount, but clearly there is a limit to what even Germany can do. Angela Merkel's government says Europe is not on the brink of a disaster. But German firms and leading economic advisors are warning that the crisis could be about to get a lot worse. Well, Ms. Speaker, how much longer can Germany play the leading role in saving the euro? Um, it can start to play the leading role if it changes is its economic model. If it doesn't um, set, uh, go, goes on to um, be eager to have net exports, so other export surpluses, it has to change this model. This doesn't work. We are at the end of this 
policy possibility. And uh, if Germany really communicates um, that this strategy uh, is at an end and will, won't be um, forced again or further on, uh, there is the chance to save the euro and uh, the monetary union, uh, especially uh, with Greece as a member. In concrete steps, if you were Chancellor Merkel's economic advisor, what would you tell her to do? I would tell her uh, to start uh, wage bargaining coordination on the EMU level so that the un unit labor costs can, which diverted, uh, diverted uh, can come back together. And this will take around 10 years, as I said. And you have to find um, an intermediate financial possibility for the countries up to the date um, 2022, um, when they will be uh, competitive again. So you have to ask the European Central Bank uh, to help the states, um, whatever is coming. And um, you can study this with the Swiss Central Bank. As when they said, we don't want um, the Schweizer Franken um, around uh, one to one to the euro. One hour later, the markets accepted uh, the exchange rate they wanted to have. So if the ECB goes ahead and says, OK, we, we don't want uh, to leave any state outside the uh, European Monetary Union, we don't want to exit them, um, this will have a great impact for the capital markets, I'm sure. But they shouldn't do this in, OK, now we have to help a little bit. But they should say, we want that. We want this European Monetary Union, and we are willing uh, to finance um, a time until they are competitive again. And the competitiveness will come back only if we have um, the wage bargainers at one table, the European wage bargainers. I'm not sure that I agree. Um, wages are usually an indicator of competitiveness. So... Um, Unit labor cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, there needs to be a difference in Europe. And I think um, export is not just about numbers, but about products. So if the Chinese people, if people in China want to drive BMWs and Porsches um, in, in big numbers, that is going to be reflected in, in labor costs um, because we, our products, our industrial products are more expensive than, say, the Greek industrial products. And I think this inequality is something we shouldn't start uh, to to uh, level. I think it's good that there are differences. I don't think uh, European uh, Europe should have the same labor costs in every one of the 27 May states. I just answer. Mm -hmm. it, it's not the case of the same labor cost. Uh, so the same wage, hourly wages are something like that. It's, mm -hmm. it's about the same unit labor cost. So if you are in Greek, you have to work, for example, three hours to earn the money for the same goods basket you get in Germany, uh, whereas in Germany you can work, for example, half an hour to get the same goods. Mm -hmm. So this is really a difference between the countries, and I'm sure you have income differences, but you have to have the prices at the same stage. Mm -hmm. There are different products. This is wonderful, but in, on a macroeconomic level, not differentiated by branches, you have to have the same prices. Otherwise, one country will win all the time, Germany, and the other countries will lose all the time, the southern European countries. And so if, if you follow this model, uh, it's guaranteed that the southern European countries are in debt and in huge debts and more debts all the time. And this comes to an end. Mm -hmm. So not the wage, the hourly wage costs are very different. They are lower in the lowest in Greece and lower in Portugal than in Germany. This is okay. This is not the problem. The problem is that the un unit labor costs. So what, what you produce, um, uh, or, uh, what, what you have to pay for the, for the labor in relation to your productivity, this should be the same. Right. This is, I mean, you've never been to Brussels. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't see, I don't see a room full of people trying to do this in Brussels. I think the compromises that are going to come out of this will be completely unacceptable to the German electorate. So this is just completely unfeasible. Let's say again, let's talk about alternatives. The alternative is not only that the German economy will go down way. We will have a rising unemployment nobody is thinking about. So the Lehman Brother crisis will be... Um, a sidewalk uh, in comparison to what we will face if uh, Greece will exit or if we don't solve the Euro, um, the Euro crisis. So if you tell the people you lose your, your job, you lose your, all, the, all the assets we have in foreign countries, um, 
yeah, the the people will accept so to say, okay, then let's try a solution where, for example, we have an inflation of 3% because we get it in the wages. We get 4.5 or 4.7 um, in wages as, an, as a growth rate in wages, and then we can afford 3% inflation. This is not a big deal. But this is the chance for the so but southern this, European countries. I think this is exactly the kind of Europe people don't want. You know, I mean, they have, they have their own traditions, even in the way they negotiate the wages. Okay, and, and this is not the problem. Look at France. France met the uh, inflation target wonderfully, always 2%. And France is in danger as well because they lost against Germany. They have a huge um, payment, balance payment deficit, so a trade deficit, against, also against Germany, also on third markets. So they are able to negotiate 2% wages wage growth, uh, hourly wage growth. So they were able to, how they did this is, is their problem. And how the Greek will be able to make 1% uh, wage growth, the unit labor wage cost uh, growth, it's their problem, okay? So they can have their own tradition how to do this. But the German have to accept that we have, after 10 years being under the target rate of the ECB, we have to be over the target rate. If we don't solve this problem, we can't have a monetary union at all. But France is not, well, France is clearly not a role model. I mean, who's buying French cars? You know, you've, you've had PSA Peugeot coming out uh, yeah, because two they're weeks too ago. expensive. This is right. But be no, because no one wants their, <laughs> no one wants their cars. You know, no, you have to cheaper. produce cars. They're cheaper than if German cars. If they were cars. cheaper, if they yeah, were they cheaper. Okay. Yeah, they, but you, you no can... one wants them. So I think you have to produce something that is attractive. And I think people should be rewarded for it, for it's, producing something. Yeah. That is attractive it's wonderful for the that global we, market. That we produce attractive goods, but we should price them as as much as we are um, putting effort in it. Yeah, but so then we, again, market, but, I think but prices are not. I mean, that's the big advantage of our economy that prices are not. Uh, uh, invented by centralized institutions. I mean, why are prices for daily goods as milk and, 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 and other stuff that you eat, food, food is very, very cheap in Germany. Not because the government said food should be cheap, but because there is a much higher competition with discount uh, retailers than in other countries. Because um, the income, the wage income is so low. That's the reason why food is so cheap no, in Germany. No. Look at Austria, Austria is much higher um, cost for, for food. Look at the because competition it, it, it of Aldi and Lidl and so yes. forth. That's, that's yes, very unique to this country. You can force um, wage earners to accept low wages if, they are the, if the unemployment rate is high. And this was the case in Germany. Mm -hmm. So you can force them and say, okay, I, I'm willing to work for five hours, uh, for five uh, euros per hour. And this is not fair. This is not uh, not a good deal. And it's for, uh, especially not a good deal if in other countries um, the society decides uh, not to let wage earners be on, on the bottom of the society. Mm. So, okay, Wetter, in more general and broad terms, the euro, not just the European Union, but in particular the euro was also designed and intended to foster, if you will, the union, the political union <laughs> amongst its members. Has that mission failed? Well, it could fail, because I think if the, if the euro fails, and I mean, Chancellor Merkel has said so, I, th I think it really puts the European Union into a major danger. So I think it's been the central uh, project, and, and I think if that fails, it's a very, very bad sign for, for the rest. Um, and I think that is one of the main reasons why uh, politicians in Brussels are trying to rescue Greece and therefore the Euro and, and Spain uh, uh, for the time being, um, they're very much aware that um, it could be the end of a big project. Moritz Stöbler, Chancellor Merkel is facing re-election in 2013. Undoubtedly, this will be the number one item mm. on the agenda. How do you think this will play out within the next uh, 12 months in Germany? Well, um, I think the next three, four months are really decisive. Um, and if if this crisis continues like it is now into, say, the next year or even next summer, if we talk about this issue in the same way we're talking about now, one year from now, I don't see how Angela Merkel could win the elections. I just don't see it. Um, because she has to come out of this crisis as the person that made it work. But let me get back to the question before, just for a second. Um, has Europe failed? I think we need a broader perspective in terms of time. Um, 
right behind you is the Brandenburg Gate. If you look back at Germany 60 years ago, 50 years ago, and you look what has been achieved in that time span in Europe in general and Germany specifically, I think we have come a long way. And this is, in the long run, this is going to be a very short span, a very small crisis. At least that's my hope. Would you agree that in in hindsight, that we will look at these times, these days, that we might have overblown it, we might have overdone it, overphrased it? No, I think it's a very critical crisis, so it's not a um, little crisis. But um, I hope we will find a way to solve it in peace, because not only the economy uh, is a problem in this crisis, but the democracy. So we had the issue several times that the German voters should be um, um, decided to <coughs> to follow a Chancellor um, Merkel in its uh, crisis management. And the same is true for Greek people, for Spanish people. So if we want to s save the democracy, uh, we shouldn't be like colonial colonialistic uh, people. Yeah. Do you think, Silke Wetter, that Greece will remain in the Eurozone 2013, by the end of this year? By the end of this year. Uh, by the end of this year. Do you think There's we will still, still be there? I'm still pretty sure. There. What do you think? Yes or no? I hope it. I hope it very, very much. Moritz yes. what do you think? Absolutely. So, I, don't, I don't see any other um, scenario. They, are not go they don't want to leave, I don't think, because it's going to be much more costly for them if they leave. Uh, we can't kick them out. So how's it gonna, how would it happen? And overall, would you say your assessment uh, for the euro in more general, broad and global terms, just one, one, two, se one two sentences, what would you say? Where is it headed? Um, I feel that we had to the explosion of the euro. Wow, that was a very drastic ending, if I may say. We're heading to the uh, explosion of the euro. Let's not hope so. But certainly this was not the last show we did on this topic. Thank you all out there for tuning in. Thank you for my guests for their insight and looking forward to seeing you again next week for a new edition of Quidriga. Riga.